Hey everybody, welcome. So nice to see you on this, our last event of our Golden Cheek Week, which is celebrating our 69th birthday. Travis Audubon turned 69th, 69 this year, this week, can't speak. We're happy to have you today. Uh, we're gonna hear from Chris Murray, who is the sanctuary steward uh, for Baker and Blair sanctuaries. Many of you already know Chris well, so we'll keep this pretty brief. Um, Chris has a BS in zoology and science education from UT Austin, and he's worked with Travis Audubon since 2010. He is the longest serving staff member we have. Um, he has spent the better part of a decade working on a wide range of ornithological research projects across the United States and abroad, and especially at Baker Sanctuary on the Golden Sheet Poplar. In addition to this research, Chris had also, has also invested five years in teaching science and STEM in Hawaii, and he taught at the Ann Richards School for Young Women Leaders before he came to Travis Audubon. And we have been lucky to have him on staff uh, since 2010, as I mentioned. So Chris is gonna tell us a little bit today about the work that he does at Baker, uh, caring for and monitoring the Golden Sheik Warbler. So without further ado, Chris, you can take it away. All right, thank you, Nicole. Um, thanks for having me. This should be a very informative uh, talk. Um, I've never given this presentation before, so bear with me a little bit. I may uh, go down some rabbit holes that I don't intend to do, but we'll get through it all. Uh, what I'm going to do is, because having the camera on freaks me out, I'm going to stop my video. I can't stand like the thought of so many eyes. So, all right. So here we go. Without further ado. What I'm going to talk about today is uh, essentially what I'm doing at Baker Sanctuary with regard to uh, golden cheek warblers. Um, and, and it's a, kind of like a multi pronged approach, which you'll see uh, pretty soon. But if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at the end. Um, just to kind of say, but I may answer the questions as I go through the presentations and then have to ask them. But, uh, but yeah, questions are great if you've got any. So, uh, I think I'm going to have to stop my share. It's frozen again. All right. Let's try this again. Share the screen. Okay. Here we go, we're in business. So golden cheek warbler, um, I'm gonna go over a little bit of the natural history of the warbler, not much, because I'm, I'm assuming that y'all know uh, pretty much what you need to know about golden cheek warblers already as far as their natural history is concerned, and focus more on the management and uh, monitoring that we're doing for this species instead. But I will go over a few, just kind of a real fast primer here, but, um, Golden cheek warblers, they're a neotropical migrant. So, you know, they're only here during the breeding season. Non breeding season, they're down south. Uh, Eric uh, gave a great talk on Wednesday about um, the wintering grounds and golden cheek warblers and what they're seeing down there. And that's kind of like the last unknown with golden cheeks. I think we, we know a lot about their breeding area and, you know, what they do up here, but wintering grounds are. More, a little bit more of a black box. We don't really know exactly what's going on down there, but we have some ideas and more data starting to come in. And I think as the technology gets better, uh, the data will get better as well. But anyway, so they march or they uh, they breed in central Texas from March to July. And actually we have golden cheek warblers here now. They arrived kind of in mass last week. So they're singing away out at Baker as we speak. After the breeding season, they fly uh, down through Mexico. They, they do not fly over the Gulf, as far as we know. So they take the land route down through Mexico, and they'll spend the winter in Southern Mexico, Central America area, and they'll fly back up in the spring. What's interesting about this, you know, I always tell kids when I go into schools, you know, this is like a 2,000 mile round trip that they're doing, you know, every single year, these tiny little passerines. And the fact that they can, Know, do that year after year, I think it's pretty amazing. All right, so 
here's the golden tooth warbler. You've got a male on the top and a female on the bottom. Now, this species is um, what you call sexually dimorphic. So, you know, to human eyes, we can tell the difference uh, between the two genders just by looking at it. And the male, as you can see, is definitely more striking. It's got this black bib and real dark black uh, crown. And the eye stripe through the eye is definitely more pronounced, whereas the female is kind of more of a greenish color rather than black. And you know, on the breast, it isn't as, as bold either. And it has different reasons for that. You know, the female is the one that sits on the egg, so she doesn't want to stand out too much. But I think also there's probably, I don't know if anybody's done any studies on this yet, but I would imagine that, you know, the vibrant colors of the male is acting as some sort of uh, genetic signal to the female. So when they're trying to select a mate for the year, you know, they're, they're making their decision based on something. So if the right plumage of the male is a good indicator that, well, you know, he's got good genes, I want some of that for my kids, then maybe more likely to get a mate. Because not all plumages are, for the males, ours equally as bright. Anyway, so males arrive in Texas before the females and they'll establish a territory, which they'll be on for the whole year. Um, the females arrive you know, a week or two later, and then they'll somehow select a male based on whatever criteria that's going through their head. And what's interesting about these males and their territories is, and we'll talk a little bit about this later as well, is that these males, um, you know, they essentially come back to the same spot every year. So they'll fly down to Central America, fly back, and they're, you know, when they come back to um, Texas, they're pretty much exactly in the same spot they were the, the prior year. It's a pretty amazing uh, feat of navigation. Okay, here's a female golden tree warbler, but they need uh, ash juniper, which people call cedar up here, to build their nests because they take the, these mature ash junipers, they have a, um, the bark is kind of like peeling off in strips so that the female will come pull that off and you can look at this nest here where she put a little bit of cardinal feather bling in there but uh, most of this on the outside is that ash juniper bark and strips and the inside they line the uh, nest with whatever soft material they can find you know typically spider webs or um, sometimes hair from from animals but they need these ash junipers to build their nests and they also need um, hardwoods to forage for insects. These guys are insectivores. So, and they use juniper to forage for insects as well. So they'll be up in the canopy, kind of probing through the leaves, you know, looking for caterpillars and whatever sort of arthropod they can find and, and eat. And as far as we know, you know, the literature agrees on some things, but one of the things that it seems to agree on is that um, they need about roughly a 70% juniper to like 30% hardwoods for ideal habitat. All right, so that was a real brief natural history of golden cheek warblers. Um, so let's get into management and monitoring a little bit. And one of the questions that I get almost all the time from various people is how many golden cheek warblers uh, do we have at Baker? And I'll maybe answer that question today. Um, but you know, that's it's something that we should know. It, it would be a good baseline number to have. Um, so we're in the process of trying to figure that out. And golden cheek warblers are really difficult to, to to count. You know, they they sing from the top of the trees. You know, their their song carries really really far. Um, so there's multiple. Uh, schools of thought on how best to count these, these birds. And we're using a couple of different ones. But um, you know, historically, uh, this is the earliest survey that I could find in my files from 1986. And if you've been at Baker, you may recognize this trail as the Baker Spring Trail. But um, if you look, you know, they were walking down the trail and they were, I think, just staying on the trail. And here, you know, there's a male and a female that they saw. Um, there's a male singing over there. I think they were just listening for males singing and they would mark on their map roughly where those males were. And for this survey, they came up, I just noticed this today actually, they came up with seven males and one female for this, for this day anyway, which is interesting because um, starting in 2000, 
and running to 2015, roughly 2015. So 15 years of data on this 100 acre survey plot that we had on the Baker Spring Trail, which is where this 1986 survey was. And, you know, roughly in that 100 acres, we've got 10 birds, give or take, you know, a couple. So this person that did this um, survey in 86, they were pretty close. Um, and so, you know, the 100 acre survey, it started off in the early 2000s, birds were not banded. And then later on, uh, they started putting color bands on birds. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But it's interesting to see like some of these older surveys when the birds were not banded, you had people out there, you know, tracking the birds down, trying to keep track of all of them. And you'd have numbers like, okay, there's uh, 25 uh, males on this plot. And then once they banded the birds and you got a more precise number, that number dropped from 25 down to around 10 or 11. So super easy to double count these guys if they're not color banded. Uh, they, they're pretty mobile, you know, they, you can't really tell them apart from one another. So color bands are definitely very helpful, which we'll look at here in a second. And so we did a hundred acre survey, you know, 15 years, but really wasn't getting at the question that I wanted to answer, which is, you know, how many birds do we have at Baker Sanctuary? I know how many birds we have roughly in the Baker Springs area from that data. And I've got data on productivity from that too, but I don't know, you know, sanctuary wide how many birds there are. So starting in 2017, um, I started what I call the rotating survey. And what I do is if you look on the map here, I started on this Northeast plot. I did that for three years, then moved to the Northwest plot, plot and did that for three years. And there was a year of overlap between these two. And this coming season, uh, we will be surveying the, the North Valley for three years. And the idea is, is to survey, you know, each plot three years consecutively until you get the whole sanctuary covered. And, you know, ideally, if we had a lot of money and a lot of staff, it would be better to survey the entire sanctuary at once for three years running, at least. Um, that would give you, a, I think, a more precise number. I think this is the second best option. It's got some other bonuses to it as well. You know, number one, I, I think it's fine to do it this way because the number of birds really don't change year to year. Like this Northeast plot, you know, had seven to eight birds every single season. This one had, you know, 12 to 13 birds every single season. The 100 acre plot had 10 to 11 birds every single season that it was surveyed. So the numbers really aren't, you know, changing much um, for breeding season, you know, barring some huge disaster down south or at Baker, I think they're just gonna remain pretty pretty steady. But another bonus to doing it this way is, you know, if I was doing the whole sanctuary at once, I'd probably have to spend all my time banding birds. I won't be able to go out and survey very much because when you're out here on plot, you know, it kind of forces you as you're chasing these birds around and trying to get recite data, you know, you have to walk the entire plot, you know, you're going over it back and forth, back and forth. So, you know, you find things like karst features that you didn't know were there. Um, you find invasive plants that you can remove or mark for removal later. Sometimes you find old trash dumps from the bakers or strange little shacks in the woods that they use for hunting, I hope. Um, so you get a lot of data from just being out there on the ground for three years that I don't think you would get if you just had, you know, you hired some techs from out of state to come in there and, and run this. So, so pretty happy with it so far. So right now we're doing, we did the Northeast, we did the Northwest. North Valley um, is the final one for the north side of the sanctuary. Lamb Creek Road right here splits the sanctuary in half. So that's a nice, good natural boundary. And so how do we count birds on these plots? So we're doing color banding. And this, this slide always invariably, when I go to a elementary school uh, and show this slide, the, the kids will gasp at the, in unison because they think that I pulled the head off the bird. And I'm just holding its corpse there for me to take a photo of. But you know, this bird's actually alive. So the, the head is between the fingers. Um, it's on its back, so it can't flap its wings. And warblers are pretty chill when you have them in the hand, unlike other birds like wrens or 
cardinals who want to rip off your flesh, but the warblers are probably one of the more sedate birds to have in hand. So we catch these guys and we put color bands on them. So this has three color bands. It's orange, orange, dark green. And this third or this fourth band here is a aluminum band. We call that the silver band. And that has a Fish and Wildlife Service serial number on it. That's about, I think it's nine digits long. But that's a unique serial number to that bird. And this color combination for this bird is also unique to that bird. So no other bird in Texas is going to have that exact color combination. And the way you read that is left, left leg, the bird's left, top to bottom, and then the bird's right, top to bottom. So that'd be orange, orange, dark green, silver. This is Cindy Sperry's hand, if you guys know Cindy Sperry. There's Cindy again. So you put up the mist net. And if you ever ran a banding station, you know uh, how they do that is they put out a, a ton of mist nets and they pretty much just catch whatever they can. So this is more targeted. And what we do here is, you know, I find a male that um, is unbanded and I'll go to his territory where I think roughly the center might, might be. Throw up the mist net, um, get out this little decoy I call the gimp, put him in a tree. And then, you know, you take your phone. Back in the day, you used to use um, audio cassettes, but now we use the smartphone. And you just play a little bit of a song underneath the, uh, the net. And the male thinks that, you know, his territory has been uh, invaded by another male and comes charging in and goes after the gimp and you know nine times out of ten he ends up in the net so so it's called a uh, targeted uh, color banding so you give them the net these nets have like little pockets they'll hit the net and fall into a pocket and they'll get tangled up now this is something that you definitely don't want to try at home unless you've had a lot of training and you need permits from the state and you need permits from the feds uh, to do this because a lot can go wrong. You know, you can break a leg, you can strain up a, a wing. Um, you know, sometimes they hit the net weird. Uh, you know, knock on wood, nothing's gone gone wrong. Baker, but um, if you're not trained well, I mean, something good. You don't you don't want to break a leg. So here, I'm putting on bands. He's just kind of hanging out. Looks like they're putting on a color band there. Okay. So anyway. Once you get the bands on their legs, um, you let them go, they fly away, they peck at them for like 30 seconds and they go about their business. So now you can track them with that unique color band combination and know exactly who's who, keep track of them. So this is like a little test. This guy's banded, you read it from, you know, if you're a birder and you're trying to recite this guy, it's a uh, left leg, top bottom, right leg, top bottom. So in this case, I'll let you look at it for a second, see what you, you think about the color combination is going to be. Remember the aluminum ones is called the silver band. Because if you do see abandoned birds, say you're at the refuge up in Lago, or if you're at Baker or on the BCP properties and you see abandoned bird, that's good information to have. Because sometimes these birds disperse. We don't know where they go. But if maybe you can catch a sight of one of these and then tell whoever's in charge of that tract, you saw blah, 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 blah. That's going to be some really good data. So this guy would be black, dark blue, mauve, silver. We call purple mauve. So we got you know black, dark blue on the left, mauve over silver on the right. All right, so you, you can generate maps like this where you have these polygons, each represent an individual technically or theoretically banded bird um, color band. So and you can see, you know, not all territories are created the same. And this one's huge. Uh, these are smaller. And this is in 2019 when actually we had the Northeast plot and the Northwest plot. We had enough surveyors that we did at the same time. And this is the only time that we actually had some overlap. But if you look here in the North, at these smaller territories, these are actually probably larger. It's just that these territories probably extend into this plot that we were not surveying. And same with this one, probably extended across the road. Um, you know, so roughly what we're from doing all these uh, color band surveys, you know, we know a few things. We know that it's really consistent, you know, about 10 acres per breeding pair at Baker. So for whatever reason, our, our habitat quality is, it's not super good, it's not super bad. It's just like kind of just middle of the road. So compared to other places. And this 
pattern seems to hold. I mean, it's 10 acres for the northeast plot per pair, same thing for the northwest. And it's the same thing really for the um, that 100 acre plot that we were surveying. So it'd be interesting to see if, you know, when we do this North Valley, if, if that pattern still holds and if that pattern still holds on the south side of the sanctuary as well. I, I imagine it will just because the habitat is so consistent. But we also get um, productivity data when we do this. You know, you go out there and you're following these birds around. And uh, eventually they have, most of them will have fledglings. Then you can count fledglings. You see who's feeding the fledgling and you make the assumption, okay, that's their babies. It doesn't necessarily have to be. I mean, there's been cases of where, um, you know, adults will feed fledglings that are not theirs. Um, but, you know, you, you can't really get too hung up on that. So we can get some numbers on, you know, how many birds fledge and survive to, to migrate. And what's interesting about this is that there's also no significant, like st statistically significant difference in productivity between all these sites. Like the Northeast is just as productive as the Northwest, which is just as productive as the 100 acre plot. So once again, it'd be interesting to see if that pattern holds. Okay, and also, I got to throw this up here, I think. Yeah, there he is. So Rico Mave, I don't know if you might have seen the blog post a while back, the Audubon posted about this guy, but for those of you that are interested, this little polygon right here in the center, that was Rico's stomping ground. And there he is in his glory. Okay, so another thing we do that I've been doing since 2017, the same, I started this the same time I started the rotating survey with the color banding is, oops, got a phone call, hang on. You notice that people call you when you don't want them to call, but when you want people to call, they don't. All right, so variable circular plot point counts, so VCP point counts. Now, I, I don't want to be color banding golden cheek warblers for the rest of eternity because super labor intensive, um, you only can cover small areas. And, you know, there's some intrinsic risk to handling birds. I mean, you just can't get rid of that. So. So I started this point count, and this is a pretty common method, you know, that a lot of people use, uh, according, including Fort Hood and you know, the Wildlife Refuge up in Lago. But um, what you do is you go out to these stations, and Baker's got 50 of them. These stations are 250 meters apart, um, and then you just go out and listen, and you write down when you hear a bird singing. So what I want to do, you know, after I get done with this rotating survey with the color bands and I've gone through the entire sanctuary, then I'm going to stop color and then that's going to be it for color band. That's, I'm going to be done. I'm just going to use this uh, BCP method to get a number of you know, how many golden cheeks are there and be able to track the trends. You know, I want to know if the population at Baker's increasing, is it decreasing, is it stable? Not that there's much I can do about that, but it's just good information to have. Um, so this uh, point count method is the way to go, I think, for the future. And so what that looks like, this is kind of a bad, this map didn't come out too well, but actually on this map, you can see landmarks typically. So this is from last year. Now I'll stand in the center here and you know orient myself north. Top of this page is north. And you've got various rings. You've got 25 meters, 50 meters, 100 meters out. I just sit there and listen. So in this case, you've got you know station 17. I started at uh, 10:04. At 10:06 and 52 seconds, I heard the first bird, which was roughly here. And I, I just kind of estimate where they're singing from. And then moved around a little bit. But then at 10:10, so this is like six minutes after I started the survey, um, this other bird moved in. They started counter singing. Now it's typically on these. Point counts, you, you have one bird, um, and sometimes you have two. And then sometimes, I didn't think this last season, I didn't have this happen, but the season prior, you know, some stations I had three of these guys. And the only way that I'm going to count multiple birds is they have to be counter singing for me to know that there's more than one. For instance, you know, this bird one, he could have moved over to where bird two is, and he could have been moving around here, but the fact that he was here. And he was counter singing with another one here. That lets me know that there's you know two birds, not just one. All right. So 
and this is, you know, roughly, so this is from last year. Um, the little yellow dots is where there is one bird. The white dot is where there's a second bird. And you can see, you know, they're, they're pretty evenly distributed across the landscape. What I want to eventually do is take this data and combine it with um, the color band survey, which is more precise, and look at you know how close are these point counts to what I know was probably there for that rotating survey. And if you look here, I mean, they seem pretty consistent. 2018, for whatever reason, maybe the weather wasn't as good. Maybe it was windier, but you know, 56, 54, 61, fairly consistent. And if you, if you look at the data, also you can see that, you know, zero to five minute time interval, that's when I'm picking up these birds for the most part, but also, you know, the five to 10 minute, I'm picking up birds too, that if I would have stopped my survey at the five minute, I would miss those birds, right? So I think I have that 10 minute interval is kind of good. So the question is, that was a real long winded explanation of how many golden sheiks uh, are there. And, um, don't hate me, but I'm not really sure. Uh, jury's still out, but I'm gonna say, you know, just based on what I'm seeing on these uh, color band and plots and what I'm seeing on these point counts is that we probably got it somewhere around 65 to 70 pairs. So that would be, you know, not all the, not all the males get a mate. So you can't really say you just double that number. I mean, usually it's like 90% of the males get a mate. So, you know, you're talking around 130 birds total. All right, so management, let's get into that a little bit. This is a cowbird cage that some Boy Scouts are making for me. You know, God bless the Boy Scouts because they, they do a lot of work out here. So brown-headed cowbirds, um, you know, brown-headed cowbirds, they, as far as I understand it, they evolved with bison back when we had bison here. And so they would follow the bison herds around and didn't have time to stop and raise young, so they would, evolved this cool way of, of doing it anyway, where they find nests that are, you know, near the, the herd and they'll, they'll drop an egg in that nest and let that bird raise their young, which is pretty cool. I mean, evolutionary standpoint, that's pretty amazing. But, you know, for some birds can spot the egg and they'll eject it, other birds can't, and golden cheek warblers are one of those birds that cannot, along with the, the black cat vireo. And so they raise the the cowbird's young to the detriment of their own. And if you look here, this is a yellow warbler, you know, feeding this gargantuan uh, brown-headed cowbird juvenile. I mean, I guess you gotta love your babies, but uh, they just don't know the difference. And so we trap them during the breeding season, uh, keep them out of the, 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 the ecosystem while the golden cheeks are um, raising their young. And we don't really, I mean, we don't really have the habitat for cowbirds at Baker. I mean, if you were to take a cowbird cage and put it by a cow pasture, yeah, you'd probably catch hundreds of them. But at Baker, you know, we don't really have any open spaces to speak of. It's mostly closed canopy woodland. So, you know, if you catch half a dozen birds a year, that's, that's pretty good. And if you look here, they were catching a lot more back in the early 2000s. And I think that was because Back then, um, to the to the east of us, that used to be a pasture, which is now uh, it's now a neighborhood. So the cowbirds have been kind of built out of their their habitat, which is good for us. I mean, less less cowbirds. All right, watch this get scary in a second. Yeah, right there. All right, so another thing that we do out at Baker is white-tailed deer management. Um, the reason for that, other than being them being kind of scary with red eyes, is that oh, let's talk about deer for a second. So the problem with deer is um, we got rid of screw worm back in the '80s, and screw screw worm is a it's a maggot from a fly, and everybody wants to look at a life cycle with maggots in it. So here it is, and so what would happen is the female, you know, they would lay these eggs on open wounds of mammals and they eggs hatch out into these maggots that look kind of like a screw. So they call them screw worm. And these maggots are not the cool maggots that just eat necrotic flesh. These are the evil maggots that will eat live flesh as well. And, um, and so what happened was the ranchers were 
losing a lot of livestock um, from these things. And so they, you know, made a fuss about it and, and they decided to, because uh, they can actually kill a host if you get enough of these maggots on, on one, especially a newborn animal, they, they could kill it and it, and it was. And so they talked to uh, the powers that be, you know, trying to rectify this and they did some studies. They learned that the female fly mates only once. And so, of course, the next step there is how about we buy an old airplane hangar in Florida and raise maggots in it? So that's what they did. This has got to be the most horrible biology, biology job that maybe has ever been invented by man. But here, there, here's the maggot farm. And so they would raise these maggots and then they would sterilize them with a low level radiation and take them and release them back into the wild with their flies. And the fertile females would mate with these sterile males and have uh, eggs that were, you know, sterile as well. And so they did this year after year after year and it's releasing millions of flies. But now we don't have screw worm in Texas anymore. I mean, it's down to Mexico still, but it's not here. But the unforeseen consequence of that was um, they were also keeping the deer population down. So more deer means, you know, these deer are browsers. They love to um, eat seedling hardwoods and they're not just general browsers. They're kind of specific. They have certain species that they like more than others. So they'll preferentially go through the woods and, and chow on these hardwoods and a lot of times they get killed when they get browsed. So by removing the screw worm from the system, the deer population exploded, which caused the, you know, the, which put more pressure on the hardwoods. And now the composition of the forest is shifting from more of a 70-30 to more of an 80-20. We're not seeing the regeneration of, of hardwoods as much anymore. And that's going to affect golden chief warblers because they need that, you know, that certain ratio. But at Baker, um, so here's a density per square kilometer, and this is based on game camera surveys that I've been doing for a while. This red line is the, I don't know where they got this number from, but this is the BCP tier two land management plan that says, well, you can probably have 14 deer per, per square kilometer. There's no literature cited for that number. They just kind of pulled it out of the air. Um, but then later in that document, it says, well, you probably need around seven deer per square kilometer if you want hardwood regeneration. And I'm not sure where they got that number either. And I did some searching in the literature and there really isn't any solid number of what the historical density of deer was in this area. It's just, it's, they're hard to count like golden cheek warblers, you know, they, the standard way to count deer is using spotlight transects. And if you have closed canopy woodland, you know, obviously um, your, your spotlight not going to go very far when it hits the, the trunks of trees. So, but you know, a reasonable guess from the literature I've, I've read and these guys that know that all they do is think about deer is you know we probably had somewhere around um, three deer per square kilometer. That's something we should be shooting for. I think another technique we have at Baker is you know we have deer fence. We just try to keep them out. Uh, if we don't have all the preserved um, fenced yet, but I think that's a goal of ours it's really expensive but for now we have a hunting program where the hunters will come out and they pay for a lease and they'll help us keep the population down that's why we close up in november and don't open again until mid-january all right so at some point i became aware of these papers by russell and fowler so they, they looked at recruitment of these hardwoods you know so spanish oak and this is you know a series of three papers that they did back in the early 2000s 1999 but um you know, some and they did their study on the BCP. I forget which area it was, but it's on the BCP. But you know, Spanish oak. You know, none have grown above 150 centimeters height since 35. Okay, that's what they found. Live oaks, black cherry, and Texas ash do not seem to be recruiting adults either. And it seems to be because of intense browsing is the main cause. Now these oaks grow pretty slowly. 12 centimeters, 12 centimeters a year was their guess. And so you need, you know, if you do the math, you know, for that tree to get to the size where it's not going to be browsed out by a deer, it would take a lot of years of protection to recruit an adult. And they also weren't sure about, you know, 
light levels, you know, ash juniper is pretty thick. And so you're getting um, a shading effect with these seedlings as well that may be slowing down their growth. And so once I read these papers, I was like, man, that kind of sounds like Baker. Because if you walk around Baker, um, you'll see these large, huge, and, and this is in the uplands, you'll see like these huge Spanish oak that probably have been there since 1900, 1935. And you'll see seedlings that have just, you know, sprouted that year or the year before, but you won't see any age classes in between those two. So they're not going from seedling to adult anywhere that I can find on Baker. Now, now this isn't probably true for the whole BCP, but it is true from what I've seen out here at Baker. So that's an issue. And we'll talk about that in habitat management. My little segue. Um, this is Baker Cabin. And if any of you are familiar with multistar thistle, which is an invasive plant, um, all that stuff you see in front of the cabin is multistar thistle. And those of you that are familiar with it probably just had a slight heart attack like I did when I first saw this, but um, we're not gonna talk about star thistle yet. We're gonna talk about the hardwoods a little bit more. But now we're talking about habitat management. So what I started to do after I read those papers by uh, Fowler and Russell is that I started to cage desirable hardwoods that I would find while doing surveys of golden cheek warbler. So say I'm walking around found a, following a golden cheek warbler and I come across a cherry and I'm like oh, that's a good spot. I'll you know it's growing. It's just being shaded out by juniper. There's nothing there's not another hardwood shading it out. That's part of the criteria. I would mark it, my GPS, flag it, and I'll come back later with a cage, put a cage on it. Then I start monitoring that tree to see how fast it's growing, um, mortality rates and things like that. What's interesting about this, and what even kind of drove this home a bit more, like sometimes, uh, and this is you know, extra true for um, cherries and the Spanish oak, but I would flag it, do my survey, go back and you know sometimes I have to build a cage so I'd come out there next week and the tree's gone already. Now something came in that time, that week time interval from when I flagged it to when I got the cage and came back out, a deer I assume came and, and ate it and it's gone. And that happens maybe, gosh, 15% of the time when I'm, when I'm doing this. Anyway, so we started hardwood caging. So I wanted to see, you know, if you put, did the simple thing of just put a cage on it, you know, that keeps the deer off. That doesn't do anything about shading. So I take away the variable of, okay, it's not getting browsed. I know that. So let's see if it's going to grow, um, even though it's being shaded by juniper or whatever else. And if it is growing, you know how fast will it, will it grow? So started that in 2013. And actually, uh, John and Marcy Wilcox, who are the stewards out here before me, they had some caged, um, they had maybe a dozen or so caged trees that, um, we're still alive and so I incorporated those into the, the data set as well but I think we got over 300 cage trees mostly Spanish oak but um other things as well got Texas ash in there as you know this is what I've been finding so they do grow it turns out if you put a cage on they're going to grow and you know Russell and Fowler's guess of 12 centimeters a year wasn't that bad because Spanish oak you know right on the right on the money 12 centimeters a year Shane Oak's only four, but they're doing something different. They're forming mots. So they're investing more energy and kind of spreading out and you're getting more stems, not necessarily higher stems. So uh, that 3.8 is a little bit misleading. Uh, live Oak, you know, 10. And which is interesting, the cherries, you now they're like the superstars. They're growing if you're on a cage. They get like, you know, double everything else, 23 centimeters. A season, you know, Texas ash is right around there, around 10. And then I've got 20 juniper and full sun that I just monitor anyway, just because I was curious how fast they grow. There's been some debate about that, but you know, the juniper by comparison are growing 35 centimeters um, a season. And this is a diameter of, of the, the stem. Mortality, you know, 19, 16%, 6%, not too bad. But here's an example of the cage. Uh, this looks like a Spanish oak in there. So, you know, the idea is you want to keep, you want to get some, some of these hardwoods into the canopy so that they can start, 
you know, continue putting out seeds and you don't have to, you're not going to get like this situation where, okay, I've got, you know, 90% juniper um, canopy cover now. And once it gets to that point, you know, any sort of management you're going to do is going to be super labor intensive. It's just easier to keep it going as is. I, hopefully this caging program, well, it's not something that I don't think you could do over a huge landscape scale. It, you know, big or small enough, I think it, it could work out here until, or at least until other management techniques are developed that somehow helps this along. And I haven't seen anything coming down the pike quite yet. All right, so invasive plants, this is getting back to that multi-star thistle. Um, one of the big things you can do as a manager is make sure that you have native habitat for the animals that you're managing for. So, um, you know, invasive plants, these non-native invasive plants, they crowd out the natives. Um, sometimes their berries are poisonous to the native uh, fauna that eat them. And, you know, given enough chance, they'll, they'll kind of take over and become a huge, huge problem fairly quickly. You got to keep on them all the time. So I'm going to talk about Tree of Heaven real quick and also the small to start this up because you're the, the two invasive plants that when I first started out here uh, 10 years ago, I was made aware of. And I think Bill Reiner from the city of Austin was the one that told me about both. He said, that's small to start this, so it's bad. Oh, man, it's a lot of it. Then he said, I was down in the North Valley. I found this Tree of Heaven grove. You probably want to go take care of that before it gets worse. So that was my first introduction to uh, invasive plant management at Baker, but it kind of was very formative for me. So in the case of Maltostar thistle, here's Baker cabin again, and that's all that green stuff in front is Maltostar thistle, it's about two feet tall. And it's roughly, I don't know, five acres of it. It's at the cabin, it was across the road in some other spots, it's at the trailer. Um, but the cabin was definitely probably the focal point of where this stuff came in, because it was the worst. And um, yeah, so I started pulling it. Sometimes I would use herbicide if it was nothing there but star thistle, like a carpet of it. And this went on for, I think I only used herbicide like maybe one time just to kind of break up this mat of it. But mostly hand pulling, you know, I'd pull it so often I'd go to bed at night and close my eyes and see multi star thistle. But it works. I mean, it, you've got to keep on it. So here's the cabin now after we rehabbed it. And, uh, and the wildflowers came back. I didn't put any seeds out there at all, you know, but these wildflowers were probably in the seed bank. And once you got that, you know, start this out of there and gave them some room, they, they took off. And now that's what you're going to see. I mean, I, I still get start this up, but it's, you know, I spend maybe a couple hours a season on it rather than, you know, 80 hours on it. So, so what I learned from this was uh, you got to be persistent. You know, you can't just do something for five years and say, oh, I got it, because you, you never really get it. You have to always be on it. And this was kind of driven home, too, with this Tree of Heaven grove that uh, Bill Reiner told me about down in the North Valley. Now, these, this was um, a grove where there was maybe 40 or 50 canopy class trees in a drainage, and they had pretty much taken over. And so I went out there. You can see my graph. You know, picture Chris out there. It's like, yeah, here's a tree of heaven grove. I brought my chainsaw, had a little uh, poison. I was gonna paint the stumps with a little mazapir, and I did it. And I felt so proud of myself. Um, you know, I cut them all down. I'm like, all right, I'm done. But I went back the next year, and there's more there. I mean, the canopy class trees are gone, but now the seed bank is activated because it's getting more sun, it's getting more water, and as you can see. The, the trend was uh, an upward one for about three years. And then I find, I'd go back every year and pull these suckers out by the, as you can see from this graph, by the thousands. And then eventually I got to the point where, okay, now they're going down and they're going down and they're going down. I'm finally exhausting the seed bank, except for if you see this little uptake here last year, I found a couple hundred there again. I'm like, where the heck are these coming from? Because and, and I looked around, looked around, I finally found it's probably an eight foot tall tree underneath a snag that I'd missed before because it was so thick in there. And this one tree was putting out enough seeds that, um, you know, I had to 
pull a couple hundred. I imagine I go back this, this next year, it's, it's probably going to be back down close to zero. But also when I was doing this, you know, this drainage uh, fed into Harris Creek. And I thought, well, it's pretty close to Harris Creek. And you know, what if there's a gully washer and these seeds are going to get washed in Harris Creek? You now, where are they going to go from there? So I walked the creek and I found a second grove um, in 2013 which wasn't as big, maybe only 15 to 20 canopy class trees, did the same thing. As you can see, they followed the same pattern. You got that spike after the initial treatment, then it goes back down. And that, that one's officially, I officially call that one eradicated. I've been back there for years uh, consecutively and haven't found anything. So I, I think that's a done deal. But the point is, I mean, you have to, you got to keep on it. This is like, you know, 2010, well, that grove number one, I'm still working on it 10 years later, technically. Grove number two, you know, yeah, like one, two, three, four, maybe five years to eradicate it. But these things are not done quickly, especially if they get to the point where they've taken over a large area. Then you've got the seed bank to deal with, as well as the adults. So with that in mind, you know, <laughs> so here's Baker, and I've removed, you know, around 17,000 invasive plants since 2010. A lot of these are one-offs, you know, you just find it kind of growing in the creek. Some are more serious infestations, but you know, the point is you got to get these things before they can take over. Because once they take over, it's it's really an up an up, uphill battle from there. And at Baker, and what I do here is um, if I find an invasive plant, if I can't pull it out of the ground by the roots, I will stump cut it. I carry a little, bit, little vial of poison in my backpack and I'll put like a little drop of poison on the stump, flag it, GPS mark it, and then I come back the next year to make sure the darn thing's dead because a lot of times it's not. Um, I would say maybe 60% of the time they're, they're still alive. Treat it again, you know, cut it again, treat it again, come back the next year, is it dead, yes or no? Usually by the second time, if it, if it didn't die the first time, it'll be dead the second time. But the point is, I mean, you can't, once again, you can't just be like, yeah, I treated that China berry, I'm done. No, you're not done. You gotta go back and look at it, make sure it's dead, make sure there isn't anything coming up in the seed bank from where it was, or you, you're really not doing anything. You're just kind of have this feel good story that really isn't too accurate. But we've got them all out there, you know, mostly China berry, um, jujube, which is a weird, I think that was planted by Baker. It's hard to get rid of, um, Nandina, the privets, tree of heaven, of course. That good stuff. Another thing for wildlife um, or habitat management is, you know, wildfire. You got to make sure that you have habitat to manage. So if you had a wildfire going through your preserve and burning your habitat down, uh, you would no longer have golden cheek habitat. You might have black cap habitat, in, you know, five or ten years, but you won't have golden cheek habitat anymore. So want to keep wildfire um, at bay as well as we can. And what we did recently, we got some money from FEMA, which is uh, Nicole's favorite government agency. And we put in the shaded fuel break on, let me go back a slide. So we put it in the entire um, border that we share with this uh, Cypress Canyon subdivision roughly 85 houses on this border. You know, this is a long, this is a pretty long stretch for a fuel break. Might be one of the longest in the BCP. I could be making that up, but I think it sounds pretty good. And so what we found, you know, the science says that when you have wildfire, typically you've got this wildland urban interface, the WUI right here. What happens is you have a fire start here. Like somebody will, I've found this as I do fence patrols. I found fireworks or bottle rockets in the forest. I found a backpack that somebody had apparently set on fire and tossed over the fence. Sometimes you'll find where somebody's cut a fence and they've got a fire ring going. So it's, you know, activity from the neighborhood that's, you know, endangering the preserve. So what you do is you put in this shaded fuel break and you have two treatment zones. You've got the red is the um, property line, yellow is zone one, so in this zone, you keep all the canopy trees, but you prune up all the limbs to a height of six feet. And the idea here is that 
by keeping the canopy, number one, it's still golden cheek habitat because they feed in the canopy. Number two, the shade is keeping the grasses and the finer fuels from growing. So theoretically, let's say you've got a fire here after the fuel break's been installed. The idea is, is that the fire is going to stay on the ground and it's going to go out. It's going to go out in the leaf litter. Instead of if it had all these branches where it could climb up into the canopy and become a crown fire. Um, and then it, once it becomes a crown fire, you know, you got more wind up there. It can skip from tree to tree, it can go back into the neighborhood. You know, we saw with was that 2011 with the Steiner fires and the Bastrop fires, how devastating that can be. So this first zone, you, know, you prune everything up to uh, six feet in height. And then the zone two, which is 30 feet out to 100 feet out, um, that's only pruned up four feet. And you also take out live oaks and junipers that are less than four inches in diameter at rest height if they are not contributing to the canopy. So in other words, if they're growing up into a canopy tree like a live oak or a larger juniper, uh, they're going to be removed as well. And there's other things too, but that's pretty much the gist of it. So that's been installed. We just finished that up last year. Makes me happy. Of course, with the ice storm, it needs a lot of work at the moment, which is keeping me up at night. And this is uh, when they were putting it in. It was Lake uh, Travis Fire and Rescue, and they subcontracted with uh, Austin Youth Works. And they had, the, I just got to kick out the name of this thing. So this is the name the manufacturer gave this um, chipper. It's called the Intimidator, which I, I guess it's intimidating. You want to fall inside that thing. But they would chip it up and just spray the mulch you know, on site, making sure it didn't get deeper than four inches in any one spot. So the next project with uh, wildfire fuel mitigations, we want to do the Lime Creek corridors. Because as you can see, a uh, fire is an issue there as well. This is from a truck fire about seven or eight years ago. And also you've got cigarette butts and you know, things like that that people toss out. So the treatment for Lime Creek Road is going to be similar to the, the shaded fuel break that we put in by the neighborhood, except it's not going to go back 100 feet. So it's going to go back 30. And it's going to be, I think, just four foot um, pruning up instead of six. But we haven't started that yet. I believe Kelsey uh, got some funds for us to, to start working on this, which is awesome. And finally, you know, this is, you know, education is probably like the redheaded stepchild of any land management plan that I've read. You know, if compared to, if you look at the, the, the tier two management plan for the BCP, you know, they go through golden cheeks and they go through white tailed deer and black caps, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, each section is roughly 30 to 50 pages long on how to manage or recommendations on how to manage. But when they get to the education section, it's like six, six pages long. I mean, it's always an afterthought, but I think, you know, education is, and this was, this was a question that Cliff had on Wednesday, you know, if the BCP is public lands, um, how secure are these lands for the future? And, the, and the, the real answer to that, I think, is it's only as secure as the public makes it be. So if, if you don't have a public that supports your preserve, and you know, luckily Audubon, we own our land, so that's not as big of an issue for us. But in general, I mean, education goes so far. I mean, it's, it's cheap to do relatively. And you get these kids when they're young, you know, plant that seed of, you know, gold cheek worm, which are super cool. You should support them whenever you can. It goes a long, long way. And Audubon's been doing a great job at um, reaching out to adults and, and kids and just, you know, working the education angle as hard as we can get. So, so you know, since 2010, we've had roughly you know 11,000 kids and uh, adults through uh, through Baker at some sort of education program like the Youth Nature Camp or Open House or Hiking Club or Guided Hikes or Eagle Scout Project. I mean, you name it. We're, we're trying to hit all hit all the bases that we can. And that's the last slide. So here's Baker Cabin after the ice storm. Um, probably something you don't see too often. But let me take questions and put my camera on and see if I can figure out how to do that. There, oh, there I am. That's kind of scary. Let's Thanks, see if Chris. I that's great. There's a handful of questions in the chat and I see a couple raised hands so we can um, 
we'll just zoom through these a little bit. If people have to hop off. Um, that's great. Um, you mentioned that Baker was sort of like medium quality um, gold cheeked habitat. Are there other what what are some places that are like very high quality and how how do you how do you tell that? Is it based on the number uh, of birds? Yeah, it's based on density. So there there are some plots on the BCP and I, I can't remember the I think Canyon Vista might be one of them off the top of my head, but I mean you can get like 15, 16 birds in the same amount of space as we've got 10, you know. So and that and that's really just dependent on factors that we have no control over. You know, we a lot of these more productive um, plots seem to be centered around canyons and there's more water available and there's a greater diversity of trees and that kind of thing. So yeah, we're we're middle of the road. Which is which is good. Yeah. Um, a question about the freeze, both about the reopening, which there will be an email going out today. But Chris, you you deserve some credit, and you can tell people about all the work that you that you've been doing um, for the past month. And then also, if um, regarding the freeze, if you have any hypotheses about how it might affect um, the gold cheeks migration or any anything having to do with the time that they are. Um, here, I know you mentioned you were a little bit worried about the oaks and be, them being able to hold enough insects for the birds. Um, do you have any? Do you have any um, insight yeah. about about what the effect of the straw might be? Yeah, I mean, I, I would highly recommend you know coming up here to see the <laughs> the devastation from the ice straw. I, I call it devastation. It's just our human you know way of that we like to think about things, but it's actually. It's actually probably a good thing, you know, honestly, this ice storm, we don't have that many disturbance events anymore in this habitat. You know, we used to have wildfire. And you can debate how frequent that was and how intense that was, but we really don't, you know, knock on wood, have that right now. And so, you know, we've got this closed canopy woodland that is mature, it's a climax community. So, you know, it's good to have something like, I think of, you know, the, the polar vortex just punching holes in this canopy. It's, it's going to allow things, maybe hardwoods, to grow in these canopy gaps that they wouldn't have otherwise had a chance. And I think, I don't think it, you know, we'll see, um, we'll see what happens with the golden cheeks, you know, we'll look at our data and especially that point count that I was mentioning will give us probably a better understanding of the population in general at Baker. If maybe it got hammered a little bit when they're migrating north. I think they kind of missed it, but I'm not sure. Um, but it seems, you know, the live oaks seem to be all right. They seem to be bouncing back. Um, all the deciduous trees that, you know, they were dormant when this happened. So they're like, they could care less. Um, the only problem is we, did, we have had some of those large, like Spanish oaks uh, get knocked down and they probably won't recover. So I think whenever you lose one of those real large mature trees, it's kind of uh, a significant loss, especially if they're not being um, replaced. Uh, so, I think in the short term, it's fine. What I'm going to be even more interested in seeing is like, uh, I do a breeding bird survey every year in June, and this is up for all species of birds. And I, I think the resident birds might've got hit kind of hard. I know like just mm -hmm. anecdotally that we used to have three or four Phoebes that would hang out at Baker Cabin and they disappeared. I think they died. And I think that may be a trend for some of these other birds as well. So when I do this breeding bird survey, I should be able to tell if the resident birds took a hit during this ice storm or not, which would be, once again, there's nothing you can do about it, but it's just interesting, uh, I guess, data. And I'm um, sorry, can you remind me, it's the south side that's reopening this weekend? Yep, south side's reopening um, this weekend. The north side minus the valley will probably be open next week. Don't hold me to that, but um, there should be a separate email coming out talking about the north reopening because we're not quite sure when that date's going to be yet. Yeah, poor Chris has been working pretty much <laughs> dusk to dawn, dawn to dusk, working on <laughs> working <laughs> on uh, making the trail safe for everybody. So thank you, Chris, for all that work. Um, there's a question about the tree caging program. How long do you keep the trees caged? That's a great question. Um, forever. <laughs> uh, but no, OK, so I mean, these trees are growing, let's say 10 centimeters a year. That's easy math, right? So what I do is when they reach about a meter in height, and I've got some that are there now, 
um, I do what I call a micro thinning around that cage so they can get more light. So if there's some juniper branches that are overhanging it, I'll trim them back. And I've seen if that's gonna accelerate their, uh, their growth. But, okay, so when they get to a meter in height, I could probably take the cage off. They're not gonna get browsed out. But what's gonna happen, and I found this out the hard way, is that deer love to rub their antlers on these, on that size class of tree. So if I were to take that cage off, I think on any, anything below four inches in diameter, I think that it's, it's a target for that rubbing of the antlers. And what happens is they, sometimes they girdle the tree and the tree dies. And I found that out, I had these cherry trees that I planted at the cabin uh, during the drought, you know, before the drought hit in 2011. And I planted three to survive and they're like my babies. I go out there and talk to them every day. And, they got so large that I finally took the cage off them. And like, you know, a week later, some deer moved in and they rubbed the, the bark on those trees. And I thought both of them were gonna die. It was so bad. They, they lived, you know, barely. But um, now with that knowledge in my head, I walk around the forest and if I see, I'm like, oh, there's a cherry. It's like, you know, it's over a meter tall. It hasn't been caged. And if I go look at it, it may be alive, but if it is alive, it's barely alive because it's been, you know, it's been rubbed and nearly girdled by the, the deers trying to you know, rub off their, uh, their velvet. So the cages are going to have to stay on until they hit four inches diameter. And that's going to be, I don't know, 25 years. <laughs> so you got you to gotta make sure you've got a way to keep track of it and make sure you go back and, and remove them when it's appropriate, which is a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. That's why it doesn't work on a, a large scale, but it can work on a small scale. Right. There's just a couple more questions. It's a little after one. So I'll just invite people if you need to go, feel free to hop off, but we'll just go ahead and answer these two questions and then we'll call it. Um, question about, are you able to record golden cheek recruitment by years? I'm wondering if the insect population decline has begun to, begun to affect golden cheeks. Uh, you know, I don't know. Um, I, think, I think if the insect, we haven't done any insect surveys formally out here, so I don't really know what's going on with that. Um, but I think if the insect population is declining, I think that would be reflected in productivity. I don't think you're going to have as many fledglings surviving um, as you would if you had a more you know, vibrant insect population. So yeah, I think there's other ways to get at that than doing like an insert insect survey. So we'll keep an eye on, you know, the um, the fledging rate and how many they're fledging and how many survive and you know kind of track it that way but once again you know that's that's the thing with monitoring there's monitoring there's management right um right. so you can monitor all you want but if it doesn't if it doesn't drive your management or if it's something that you're monitoring and you can't really do anything about it if you have limited resources maybe spend your time working on the habitat instead because at least you can affect that. I can't, if the population did start to decline, I mean, the best you could do is start lobbying your um, your, your political leaders. I mean, it has to be a, a countrywide, statewide initiative. It's not something that Baker alone can, can reverse. You know? Right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and the last question, um, do you see a difference in Golden Cheek territory density between the area adjacent to the subdivision on the southeast side compared with similar habitat that is not adjacent to a developed area? And then any comments regarding reproductive success between those two areas? Yeah, so that'll be interesting. We haven't done the color banding survey on the southeast side yet. But, um, you know, actually that, but I have done point counts down there and birds are there. I know they're there. I've, I've heard them. Um, and that one example that I showed you with the two birds counter singing, well, one of them was counter singing right on the fence line of the neighborhood. So they're there. I, I would guess that um, they tend to avoid that area to some degree, but we're not going to really know until we can get down there with color bands and, and track them and, and see what they're up to. So right now we don't really know. But that would be a, a great question when, when we get there, and then that's something that we'll be looking at. Um, but you know, once again, 
not much you can do about it, right? So, uh, which is, you know, I mean, the best thing you can do, you know, TNC has the best model, I think, you know, just buy the darn land. That's the best thing that you can do for most species. Because once you have the land, then, then you control it. And that's, <laughs> that's a lot. But um, after that, you know, you're just monitoring and managing. And there's only so much you can do. I think the biggest adjustment for me was coming in, you know, my, my passion was ornithology, right? I love birds and I did that for years. But when I got here and I started to realize what this meant, it's really, I'm acting more like a forester. You know, that's really what's needed here is somebody who can manage the, the ecosystem, not so much manage the specific bird that is in the ecosystem because you're limited to what you can do with that bird, but you're not as limited to what you can do with that, the habitat, which the bird needs and it all you know, stems from there. So just kind of like this paradigm shift of, I need to count on the birds and blah, blah, blah. Like, no, I actually, you know, that, that's good, but time may be better spent getting rid of invasive plants. <laughs> so, which is great. Yeah, making, <laughs> making it hospitable for them to be there. Yeah. Yeah, lots making of the best habitat the they can have. Yeah, lots of comments in the chat about your heroic work in uh, mitigating invasive species. Lots of folks uh, telling you you should win awards and congratulations. Bill Reiner actually spoke up and, and he credits John Chenoweth for your uh, star thistle focus. <laughs> I um, think it was Bill. So, no, Bill, no, well, Bill, my, Bill heard it from John, it sounds like. Okay, um, all right. But you can take that it's up with him. But um, yeah. we should wrap up, it's it's a 107, but this was such a great uh, talk. I always learn a lot from you, Chris, and I, Laughed. I had to put laugh out loud because then my computer told me that I was muted whenever I laughed hard at your <laughs> evil deer photo. So um, thank you for it's entertaining and informative talk. Everybody really enjoyed it. And um, thanks to everybody for being here. Hope you have a great weekend. Enjoy the outdoors and take care. All right. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, thank you. Bye. <laughs>